In this video we practice using image sampler by creating a mesh terrain. We also touch on topics of mesh topology and analysis, evaluating and visualizing slope steepness. If you feel you might need to catch up for this one, I advise you to have a look at the previous exercise where we've used a graph mapper to displace mesh vertices along the z-axis. So instead of using an attractor point and a graph mapper, we're going to use an image sampler with a height map as a displacement map. I begin with a separate sampling grid for the image sampler, leaving the default sampling domain from 0 to 1. Let's connect the image sampler output as vector magnitudes and we can see in the Rhino preview that the vertices have been displaced accordingly. Don't forget to right-click on the image sampler to make sure that the filter is set to brightness or double-click to check all the settings. So this is the most basic setup. Let's now make some changes. I'm going to disconnect the points from the image sampler and create a rectangle. This rectangle will define the size of our terrain. In this instance, I'm going to directly connect mesh vertices as sampling points. For this to work, we need to match the image sampler domain to the rectangle size domain. So such definition is more efficient if the size and the location of the terrain are fixed. If we want to, we can also manipulate the height map output values. Here, as an example, I'm using simple multiplication, but this is a more abstract, scaleless example. Let's move towards creating a true-to-scale terrain. I have another image, a height map of a specific area, and I know the approximate size of it. In my case, the area is not square, so I need to use a second range component to define the different number of steps in the y direction. I'm going to right click on the steps input and assign the ratio matching the image proportions. Notice that I am not changing the domain, only the number of steps. You could imagine that the image is now squeezed to fit within the default 0 to 1 domain and the sampling grid is squeezed the same way. So there is no need to change the domain, we just need to make sure that the target grid is correct in size and proportions. In this instance, the mesh plane's height count must match the number of steps in the Y domain. Let's connect the image sampler to the z-vector and we get a mesh. It looks flat, but only because the vector magnitudes are very low compared to the size of the mesh plane. We need to remap these output values. I'm going to use the remap numbers component for that, and again, we need to know the actual highest and lowest values. In my case, the target domain is from 1100 to 4800 meters above sea level. So that's how I get true scale mesh terrain from a height map. We could then use the gradient to color the mesh terrain based on the altitude. A quick side note, sometimes it is useful to add a relay object to keep the wires connected if the input might change. Let's now zoom into the output mesh and go under Mesh Utilities. I advise you to explore the innate mesh tools that Grasshopper has to offer. I'm going to touch upon just a few of them in this tutorial. Let's look at the triangulate component first. As you see, this tool has divided quadrilateral mesh faces into triangular ones. The mesh topology has changed, but the location of the vertices stays the same. Let's go back under the Mesh Utility section and choose the Smooth Mesh tool. The Smooth Mesh component displaces the vertices of the initial mesh to make it more smooth. The Strength parameter takes floating numbers from 0 to 1. We can choose to skip naked vertices, the boundaries, assign the number of iterations and the displacement limit. The displacement value depends on scale. It sets the maximum distance between the vertices in the initial mesh and the vertices in the smooth output. Since we are here, I'd like to mention a very popular mesh editor called the Weaverbird, which primarily focuses on topological mesh editing tools.
I encourage you to check it out if you feel this might be of interest to you. Let's now move on to the analysis of the terrain. I'm using the relay object again, transferring our constructed terrain. I begin by deconstructing the mesh. With this component, we get the mesh vertices, face order, vertex colors, and mesh normals. We're going to focus on the normals. To see vectors in the Rhino preview, we need to use an additional tool, the vector display. We need to assign the starting points or anchor points and vectors. For the first input, let's use vertices, and for the second one, mesh normals. So we can see the arrows indicating vector directions, but the preview is not informative enough since the default vector length is a single unit and in this scale it's too short. Let's go under Curve, Primitive and choose Line SDL component. The Line SDL creates line segments using the starting points, direction vector and length. So we need to use the length matching the scale of our geometry and assign the lines as vectors to preview. To evaluate the steepness, we are going to compare mesh normals with the vertical direction, which represents gravity. The next step is to evaluate the angle between these two groups of vectors at each vertex. Under Vector, again Vector, choose the angle component and before moving forward, let's investigate how this component works. Here I have a very simple setup with two vectors. The first vector is parallel to the default x-axis, and I am rotating its copy to create the second one. I'm using the default z-axis as a rotation axis and setting the rotation angle in degrees by assigning the conversion from radians inside the input. Under Math, Trigonometry, you will find components for such conversions, radians to degrees and vice versa. As I rotate one of the vectors, the angle component measures the angle between them. The first output always returns the smaller angle and it never exceeds 180 degrees. Also, in this scenario, the order of vectors doesn't matter. I'm going to restore the initial vector order and let's introduce the reference plane. I'm going to be using the default XY plane. Now pay attention to the angle output and notice that the angle exceeds 180 degrees because the angle is now measured relative to the plane. In the default XY plane, the Z axis faces us and in Rhino's right handed coordinate system, the degrees are counted counterclockwise. So when we are measuring the angle, we start from the A vector and move towards the B vector counterclockwise. This means that the plane orientation and vector order are essential. And finally, the second output, the reflex angle, will give us whatever is left after subtracting the first angle from 360 degrees. Let's go back to our mesh analysis and input mesh normals and Z vector to measure the angles, leaving the plane input empty. We are now ready to visualize the slope steepness. I'm using the gradient for that with four colors. The parameters to evaluate along the gradient range are the angle values and before we continue let's grab the mesh colors component to see what we have at this point. Everything works fine, but we need to decide the gradient limit values. I'm going to leave the lower limit at the default value of 0 and change the upper limit to be at 45 degrees. We can also zoom in, select the two groups of vectors and check whether the gradient colors are correct. The closer the two vectors are, the flatter the terrain is, so we get green and blue colors. And as the angle between the vectors widens, we see more red and black. One important thing to mention here is the difference between vertex normals and face normals. There is a separate component to extract mesh face normals and the face center points if that's what you need.
We are almost done, but before we part, I'd like to remind you that the gradient preview depends on the color percentages, meaning that if you are using the gradient for analytical purposes, you should take into account at what percentage the color is changing and control the precision. And also, if the resolution is too low, you might lose some important data, as you can see in my preview. With low resolution, no black slopes are visible, and that is because the gradient limit values are arbitrary numbers not related to the input mesh. So I'm gonna leave it here. Don't hesitate to share your questions and insights in the comments below and give us thumbs up if you find the tutorial useful. I will see you in the next one.